Well, welcome to the first of our five Ready for Business webinars in partnership with the Cayman Islands government. My name is Will Pinot. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Chamber of Commerce. And as we, while we begin, I'd like to ask you, like I said, if you are, have your camera on, I'd ask you to turn it off and also to keep your microphone on mute during the presentation. And I'd ask you, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, there's a chat feature, so you can just certainly post those questions to the chat and, and, and um, our presenters will respond to those questions either in writing during the presentation or after the presentation when we have the question and answer period. So this Ready for Business um, webinar series has been developed to help both employers and employees uh, to prepare for the reopening of our borders in a safe and in, in, in a safe pat, uh, as possible as, um, process as we learn to coexist with COVID-19. The Chamber of Commerce, we represent about 600 businesses and associations and individuals across the three islands. And we know there has been much done to prepare to help you in your organization uh, to adjust to this new normal and we hope this webinar series will also provide some further information for you. So I'd like to thank you for joining us this morning and supporting employees in times of uncertainty. We know the road to recovery will bring with it changes and some level of community and workplace anxiety. Today, we're gonna to talk about overcoming the barriers and embracing the change in work practices. The format for today's webinar is as follows. We'll have a 20 to 30 minute presentation followed by a question and answer session. And today's speakers will try to answer as many of your questions as possible, including in the chat feature. So today's topic, as I said, is supporting employees in times of uncertainty. It'll be presented by Dimphna Carton. She's the community psychiatric nurse with the Cayman Islands Health Services Authority. Uh, Dimphna has been in this role uh, with the HSA for the past 24 years and has extensive firsthand experience in acute mental health and crisis intervention. We are also joined by Shannon Seymour. She's the founding director of the Wellness Center and a psychologist with over 20 years experience. We remind you that this, this is being recorded and will be available for, for you to watch on the Chamber website and other social media platforms. So I now welcome Ms. Carton to begin her presentation. Thank you, Will. Just about to share the screen. Okay, here we go. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the Chamber of Commerce and the Cayman Islands government for preparing this webinar series and also to Shannon, who is here with me today, and I'm grateful um, to her for her support. And also in the corner with me, who would be reminisce of, of me if I forgot to mention, is a gentleman by the name of Tony James, who is one of our techs um, at the hospital IT department, and he's just fantastically helpful and useful. So thank you, Tony, for being my little sidekick. Okay, so today's topic is supporting employees in times of uncertainty. Um, and what the, I've, I thought this was a, a great um, initial quote, the pessimist complains about the wind, the optimist expects to see change, and the leader adjusts its sails. Well, you know, from a practical perspective, it's, it's important to have all of those three qualities, I think. It's good to see challenges. It's great to have hope. But as leaders and as uh, managers and as, as co-workers, it's important that we can find ways to adjust and, and to work in different ways and to acknowledge and understand the challenges that some people may be facing and how we can accommodate those. So um, that's the initial introduction. We're going to be looking at challenges, unexpected, unexpected, the early interventions, spotting the signs of stress, 
and poor mental health, encouraging people to talk about their mental health, supporting staff to stay well and in work. Um, then we'll have um, help available, um, how we can create and adapt to more accommodating work environments and how we can access services for ourselves, colleagues, friends, family, if so needed. So we know that working remotely with the restrictions, negative news and economic recession caused by the pandemic has affected many people's mental health. In February 2021, the Kaiser Family Foundation conducted a survey to look at the impacts that the COVID pandemic had on mental health. During the pandemic, about four in 10 adults in the US reported symptoms of anxiety or of a depressive disorder and an increase from one in 10 from January to June 2019. Research from July 2020 found specific negative impacts on mental health, such as difficulty sleeping, and that was obviously not getting, not being able to get to sleep at night, or waking up in the middle of the night and not being able to go back to sleep, or oversleeping. Um, certainly increases in alcohol consumption and substance use, um, difficulty eating, 32% change there, and that was overeating, again, to undereating, to people feeling that they couldn't eat, there was a loss of appetite because they were worried, um, and there was a worsened chronic conditions, and that was 12%. Researchers have found that social isolation and loneliness are linked to worse cardiovascular conditions and mental health. And I want to go back just to the increases in alcohol consumption and, and substance use. It certainly we in Cayman, and I don't think that we have any figures on this as yet, but um, felt that there was just definitely an increase in, of course, drinking at home because the bars were closed, restaurants were, were closed, people were under stress, perhaps people that might have never had a drink of home that would have relied on just having a social drink, increased their drinking, um, you know, porches and kitchens, sitting rooms, um, the back garden all became the new local hangout, the new bar. So um, moving ahead um, and, and for, for, for people preparing to come back into work, it certainly is an issue of concern. So we also know that during this time, that, uh, that babies were born and people died, people fell in and out of love, hearts were broken, marriages broke up, domestic abuse escalated, people adapted to serious life-changing conditions, accidents happened, people lost their homes, their loved ones and pets, people lost their jobs or continued in jobs that they hated because they had to. People celebrated birthdays, anniversaries, graduations, cars broke down, plumbing failed, and the AC packed up. And many of you may recall our Premier um, at the time, Premier McLaughlin, on one of the press briefings, uh, briefings speaking about his challenges with his AC not working and not being able to get an AC tech in because, of course, we were in lockdown and there was restrictions. So everybody from the top to the bottom experienced challenges and hardships um, in some way. And to top it all, we all got older and we couldn't travel. So what are some of the challenges expected and unexpected going back to work and getting back into a work routine? Well, for those who have been working from home, it may be, you know, getting up, um, having to prepare to get showered, to get dressed, to be presentable, to get on the road, to fight the traffic, to have breakfast. This is something that for some people who were either not working or working remotely, you know, they didn't have to worry so much about the presentation. I think that was, uh, you know, we look at, uh, have got down hair and makeup there. And it was certainly one thing that we all enjoyed about COVID was the, the relaxation with our appearances and uh, the lack of um, availability and the restrictions in respect of the beauty salons and hairdressers, barbers, etc. So, you know, a lot of people grew extra hair, longer hair and uh, big beards. Some people still have them. 
but we've got to consider juggling traffic, you know, and in particular for people who don't have a car, have to rely on public transport, live out in the eastern districts, you know, you've got to factor in getting up on time, what access is available, can you consider a car ride, is it something that your business can do to facilitate transport. This new expenses in terms of the transportation, you know, if you do rely on a bus, you've got to find money for that. Many people have had, you know, grave hardship, financial hardship in the last year and a half um, and, and going back to work and before they're paid initially, um, you know, how are they going to pay for that bus fare? How are they going to manage um, in respect to childcare? You know, many people enjoyed being at home, being at home with their children, um, not having to pay for childcare because they were able to look after them because they were either working from home or because um, they were off. They, they weren't working, but they had this protracted time with their children. Now they've got to factor in childcare. Does that mean bringing someone into the home? Um, does that mean paying for childcare in a facility? Again, this is extra money. It's extra uh, it, it encompasses further stress on travel time and preparation. For people who were introverts, um, who enjoyed working on their own, who enjoyed being on their own, going back into a work situation can in fact be quite challenging, can be difficult and can be a source of worry and stress. Um, how will they adopt um, and how will you um, cope with them? How will you cope with someone who's always generally quiet but making them feel secure, wanted, that they're an important part of the team? What about people who suffer from social anxiety, right? And and we know that this is, you know, this is not a new problem. This is certainly a condition that's been around for a long time. And, and quietly, many people suffer with social anxiety, you know, and on from the outside, they look like they're that lovely, beautiful, calm swan. But underneath, you know, their little legs are going like billy because their heart is pumping. They're feeling breathless. They're feeling that they're being judged, um, that they're not an important member of the team. So that is going to be a challenge. What about those people who have been used to managing their own time and their schedule? Um, of course, there's the potential for increase in productivity. But likewise, you know, if people are facing difficulties that we're not aware of and that you are not aware of as co-workers, as managers, as employees, how can we change that, right? How can we try and, and fit everyone in? Um, there's the adjustment to new protocols, because of course many people were all going, you know, our protocols have had to change again recently because of the, the rise in community transition. So we're all back to wearing masks at work, we're back to social distancing. Some people are very anxious about getting sick, about contracting uh, COVID-19, uh, about taking it home to, to vulnerable people in, in their household, to elderly, to young children, etc. And of course, we can't forget the office politics because not everybody has the, the luxury of working in, you know, such a great environment. Some people um, actually find their, their work environment very, very difficult. And some people, it it's, can be toxic. Um, there can be a number of issues. So that's a big adjustment in going back to work with people that they previously had challenges with, that they previously did not get along with. Or as I say, for people going back into jobs and having to confront jobs that they previously did not enjoy. You know, not everybody has the, the bonus of doing a job that they genuinely love and feel challenged by and stimulated on a daily basis. You know, I, I am fortunate that I am one of those people, um, you know, and, and after, you know, many years, 35 years working in mental health, you know, it never ceases to amaze me. It never ceases to bore me. It's And it's a, a source of constant challenge. Um, and I thank the Chamber of Commerce and the Game Island Government for giving me one of those challenges today. Um, what about someone who has a new medical condition, um, who's, you know, ongoing treatment um, that perhaps when they were last at work, that wasn't the case. So they're going back to work. They're maybe feeling not as strong physically as they used to. Um, they've got regular appointments that they must attend. Um, and, you know, they might just be feeling a little bit under the weather, right? So we, we've got to be mindful of them. 
I think another uh, group of people that this could be very challenging for is new parents. There will have been some mums and dads who, you know, had children at the start at the onset of the pandemic and perhaps have been working from home since. Um, originally had planned to return to work, but because of the situation decided to stay. So as, as a new parent, you know, you've had a really lovely protracted bonding time with your child and so much more involved than you thought that you would ever have had the, the time and the, the, the money to do. Because of course, you know, many people are back at work as parents because they, they do need the money. So I think it's going to be difficult for parents who have spent a long time at home with their children, whether they be new babies or little toddlers or even um, older children who perhaps weren't doing so well in schools. And, and funny enough, this is something that we are aware of um, and that one of my colleagues was speaking about recently, is that children who were having difficulties in school, having difficulty focusing, difficulty with attention, perhaps it's some, um, you know, just not, some people would say maybe not just towing the line, but they felt that since the, you know, since being at home and with the home learning and increased support and better one-to-one -one, um, attention, they actually did better. I also heard that apparently the babies that have been born uh, for the majority during COVID are so much more advanced and, and, and doing things at an earlier age because guess what? They've had this constant support and more engaged attention and probably, you know, with bigger and extended families around them again because we know that you know our family situation our family dynamic is slowly but surely changing but perhaps it was one of the beautiful things that COVID did was it did bring people closer together again and people got to know their families better. Another group of people that I think we, we have to be mindful of are those individuals who have lost a, a close uh, partner, whether it be a spouse, um, an elderly parent, um, a child, a friend, someone that was very close and meaningful in their day to day life. Going back to work again, going back into that environment is going to be, without doubt, not easy. And the thing about bereavement is, you know, we say that it normally takes for about two years to someone to you know, to properly adapt and to come to terms with that loss. And I think, you know, certainly COVID changed that for a lot of people. And of course, you know, many people didn't have the availability to conduct the funeral service um, in the way in which it would normally happen. The support that one would get as a family or in the community with people coming to the house, not just at the onset when the person had passed, but for weeks and for months afterwards, that wasn't there for a lot of people. So in some ways, it kind of put their uh, bereavement on a little bit of a hiatus. And now coming back to work and adjusting to this new norm is something else that they've got to deal with. And, you know, and, and speaking from a, a personal perspective, you know, I, I lost my husband uh, just over two years ago. And, you know, everything after that loss is is a new normal and and things that you did that were so you know you didn't even have to think about them the day before but after that loss everything you're doing it on your own for the first time so you know going back to work going back into a social environment just picking yourself up and getting on with it it can be it's a challenge so i would say that we have to be very mindful of uh those people. So what are some of the, um, the early signs of perhaps stress and, and poor mental health? Well, we can break this down into three categories. So to begin with, we've got physical. So you might notice that someone is fatigued. They may complain of headaches. There may be aches and pains. There may be visible tension or trembling. There may be nervous, shaky speech. There may be excess sweating. They may complain of indigestion problems. They may complain of feeling nauseous, um, feeling sick, um, not having much of an appetite. Or you might notice that someone is particularly overeating as a way of coping 
with some concerns. There can be psychological symptoms as well, right, and signs. So what could they be? They may be tearfulness. There may be mood changes, blunted, high mood, indecisiveness, a lack of motivation, a loss of humor in someone who was previously, you know, perhaps like a little bit of an upbeat, joyful person, and they just seem to have lost their swat of eve. They're not interacting with everyone, everyone as they used to. There may be increased sensitivity. There may be lapses in memory, perhaps even mild confusion, sometimes irrational thought process, processes. So they may say things that are completely irrational to you or I, but to them, it feels very real. They may be hypervigilant, every noise, every door that opens, every voice that is heard. Um, that may be, they may, may be alarming for them. They may be responding to sensations and experiences not observed or felt by anyone else. And most importantly, if there's any expressions of self-harm um, or thoughts of wanting to harm themselves and expressions of that their life isn't worth living, um, and that they'd be better off dead. Very concerning. There are behavioral signs as well of stress and poor mental health, and they can be increased smoking and drinking. They can be withdrawal. They can be less social than prior. Um, they can be a little bit more irritable. There can be sometimes anger or even like aggression. And when we talk about aggression, we're talking about, you know, perhaps people snapping at someone, um, losing their temper very quickly without without any trigger. Uh, there can be overexcitement when some someone seems particularly buoyant and joyful and that this is sustained for periods of time. There can be restlessness. There can be lateness. Um, and those who are overworking, leaving the office, leaving the work environment long after the working day should have ended. It can be difficulty with co-workers, disruptive argumentative behaviour, and there can be isolation. And as I said, hyperactivity, um, uh, which would fall into the overexcitement as well. So when someone just seems that they can't settle, they can't rest, that they can't be calm, that they can't relax. So the most important thing is that it's really important that if you have a concern and if you have any worries at all, that you facilitate an early conversation about need to identify problems and support very early on. In all cases, this should be treated the same way as somebody with a physical condition. So if someone walks into the office or into the workplace tomorrow morning and you notice that they're limping, you have no hesitancy in saying to them, oh, I noticed that you're walking with a limp today. Well, what happens if somebody walks into the workplace tomorrow and you notice that they seem very sad, they seem down, they seem very preoccupied? You notice that they haven't taken the time and attention with their appearance or something's a bit off. It is OK to ask, are you OK? So we want to encourage people to talk about their mental health, right, and support them as best we can. So how do you do that? Well, any conversation should be had in private, in a calm and a welcoming environment. We've got to protect the person's dignity. We've got to avoid interruptions. Make sure that phones are turned off. Make sure that, you know, it's, it's, it's clear that you're in a private meeting with someone that you would prefer that no one, that you're not disturbed. Ask simple, open, non-judgmental questions. Avoid patronizing responses. Maintain good eye contact, but try not to eyeball someone. So these are all part of being, of actively listening. So that it's you're understanding what someone is saying and you're empathizing. Um, be prepared for silence and be patient because not everybody is going to be able to speak openly initially about some concern that they may have. We have to remember that, you know, people are, everybody's very different. And some people are very good about speaking about themselves, speaking about what their worries are, speaking about issues that may be happening at home. Not everybody is that way inclined. 
And I would urge also that we avoid making assumptions and under and never underestimate people. Um, you know, likewise, just because someone presents into work um, who is well turned out, who is regularly on time, who does their job really well and is never a problem member of the team. But if they're seeming that something's going on and they're not able to talk about it, maybe it's not in a thing that is work related. And very often it's not, but maybe there's relationship problems. And we talked earlier about, uh, you know, the increase in domestic abuse that happened throughout the world during COVID-19. Well, be mindful of that. And particularly when you are addressing someone who has issues. So when I say again, be prepared for the silence and be patient. Um, here are some questions that you could use. So these are like little prompts. So you might say, how are you doing at the moment? You seem to be a bit down, to be a bit upset, maybe under pressure. Are you frustrated about something? Is everything okay? I've noticed you've been arriving late recently and I've wondered if you're all right. I've noticed the reports that are normally on time are late. Is everything all right? Are you okay? Is there anything I can do to help? What would you like to happen? How can I help? What support do you think it might help? Something that is very important is, have you spoken to your GP or have you looked for help or support elsewhere? I'm gonna come back to the GP in a little minute. So things, questions that we want to avoid are making assumptions like you're clearly struggling. What's up? Why can't you just get your act together? Well, what do you expect me to do about it? Your performance is really unacceptable right now. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Everyone else here is in the same boat. So, you know, what's wrong with you? Why aren't you being a team player? What do you do me? What do you expect me to do? I'm struggling. How do you expect me to manage? So things, definitely things not to say. Um, so going back to the GP and I've referenced that in help available. So I've previously spoken about people who may be bereft, people who may be ongoing uh, medical treatment for a physical diagnosis, um, uh, new mothers coming back to work, separation from children. But I also want to speak about drug, drug and alcohol misuse. And, you know, to be very, very mindful of that. And if you suspect that a member of staff has changed this habit and does appear to be under the influence of either drugs or alcohol at work and appears to be suffering as a result of the same or even experiencing some withdrawals, it's really important that you do speak to them very quickly and very privately about this and that you encourage them to address um, and to seek help. Um, withdrawal from alcohol and drugs can be a medical emergency with serious implications. So I would urge you to be very aware of that. Um, and, and again, not to be frightened to say to someone, and particularly you may even smell alcohol on someone's breath, but again, taking them aside, being gentle, being kind, being compassionate, not judging, asking them to share their story, to share with you what their struggles are give them time and be patient. The other thing why GPs are really important is because there are many uh, medical and physical conditions that can present as symptoms of stress or of mental health, mental ill health. And those can be someone who is presenting with a, an underactive or an overactive thyroid, you know, a high or a low sugar, an underlying, perhaps undiagnosed neurological condition. Um, many things, again, going back to the drug and alcohol use. And also another important group of people that we want to talk about is women who are perhaps menopausal. And we know that there are a number of women out there who are working and menopause clearly is something that affects every woman and generally starts from 45 to 55 but the average age is 51 and sometimes as a result of the changes um, of perimenopause and menopause women can feel um, 
very overwhelmed. They can feel a little bit anxious. There can be changes in mood. There can be difficulty sleeping. There can be changes in appetite. There can be physical things that make them feel very uncomfortable um, and make it difficult for them to stay on their work as much as they, on top of their work, as much as they have previously been up to. So it's very important that we are mindful of all of those. And so what do we do? Well, we, you know, as employees, as employers, as colleagues, it's very important to create a culture of trust, uh, one that offers accessibility. And as I say, vital that you facilitate early conversation to identify and implement support and changes. As I said early, earlier, you know, never um, overestimating, but never underestimate people. And throughout my career, I have frequently been reminded of this because even as a mental health professional, many years standing, you know, I've been presented with some um, situations and some individuals at times when I sincerely felt very, very overwhelmed um, because their, their problems were so great that it was like, well, what, what can I do? What can I bring to the table to really offer genuine and practical assistance to this person? And what I learned was that going into that situation and being honest about it and saying, you know, in your own words, tell me what the problems are. Tell me what you think might help and how I can come with you along that journey and help you. And surprisingly, when that has happened and very often, and the, the biggest thing that we have to remember here, and that again, it is vital, is that sometimes by sharing a problem, by getting it off our chest, um, we're actually addressing it. Because number one, that shows insight, it shows decision. And again, in my experience, very often people know what the problems are and they know what the solutions are. And sometimes it's just speaking it out and speaking it out to you as an employer, as a manager, as a co-worker is what it's about. So it's again, it's about being approachable, being accessible. Flexibility is definitely key. Being able to, to you know, to, to work around problems, being able to offer people solutions to practical problems that they're having, but allowing them to work. Because of course, I mean, work does have to get done, right? But when we work together with people, as opposed to working apart, we do get more done and we gain greater trust, we gain greater buy-in to the work environment. Um, again, being empathetic and, and compassionate and, and not making it all about you, right? So, you know, to be mindful that if someone does come to you with a problem, and it's very hard because, you know, people might say, well, oh, I completely get it because this is, you wouldn't believe what I'm going through at the minute. And here's this, and then it becomes about you. No, they're coming to you. So you need to give them that time. You need to give them that platform to ventilate and to work together on solutions to seek alternatives. Um, it's also really important. And I think it is something that is really changing in our community and, and communities throughout the world is that people are able to talk about mental health so much more. Companies are doing so much more to address mental health needs um, and to ensure that staff are aware of resources available. And they're training their staff as well in mental health. So there's something that we have here in the Cayman Islands called Mental Health First Aid. And it is a short training um, that is set up to equip lay people to deal with uh, mental health emergencies, just as you would deal with a physical emergency. You see someone on the street having a heart attack, you see someone fainting, someone falling down, someone gets knocked over. You know what to do, right? You've got the basics. Well, mental health first aid is about equipping people with the awareness and the ability to cope. It's about looking, it's about listening, and it's about linking to help and getting people that help. And the current trainers of that are Sylvia Wilkes, who I'm sure many of you know, and Hilton Grace. And I'm sure many of you know Hilton 
But if you are interested in um, equipping your staff to deal better with mental health um, illnesses and conditions and, and just being better equipped in, in general, then please reach out to them. And if you don't know how, I am very happy to put them in contact with you. Um, also, to lead by example, you know, to ensure that you're working sensible hours yourself, that you're sharing the workload, that you're taking lunch breaks, that you're using your annual leave, and that you're resting after busy periods. And I think that, you know, in preparing to go back to work um, for those who have perhaps not been working for a while or who have been working for home, you know, do it encourage your staff encourage your co-workers to do a dry run okay we're going to be starting work properly i'll be in the office i'll be working in the in the, uh, the workplace environment um officially on monday but you know for the the next few days i'm going to get up when i set that clock i'm going to decide what time i need to be out of bed what time i need to be in the shower what time i need to get breakfast sorted what am i doing with the children how am i getting to work what am i going to wear so having a dry run uh, might be something that would be really useful. So what are some of the, the help available and the useful resources that we have here on island? Well, I know that many companies have in-house occupational health programs. Um, so where they employ um, different therapists and, and wellness programs and I think that it's maybe something that Shannon can speak about in a little bit because I know that the wellness center um, is an in-house service to a couple of companies so perhaps Shannon can speak about that. We also have the employee assistance program which has a number of contracts with governmental organizations and, and if you don't, they're always happy to take on more and they're, they're very ready and, and willing and available. Um, we have the Counseling Centre, which is self-referral, free of charge, another great service that people can use. Um, in times of an emergency, please do not hesitate to call 911 or, you know, encourage um, an individual or individuals to go to the emergency room. And of course, we have the Mental Health Helpline, which is open for advice and general support. And I would say brief and uh, solution focused um, counselling. Uh, it's private. It operates nine to five, Monday to Friday. And that was born out of the COVID pandemic and runs to date. We also have the HSA Behavioural Outpatient Department. The numbers are there. You can uh, ask your GP to refer or perhaps a, another counsellor that you're seeing or a professional. The number AA I've got in here and that's really important um, and I want you to take note of that. So if you have concerns about a co-worker, a friend, a colleague, an employee and you feel that there is a substance issue, um, and they're not willing to address it or you don't know how to approach them, please feel free to call um, because they're very accessible, they're very willing and it's a tremendous programme. As we said earlier, encourage to check it with your general practitioner. I mean, general practitioners are very accessible, they're very robust, they're just they're the broad spectrum doctor that can deal with everything. And, you know, very often um, they're very uh, able to start someone um, on a treatment if there is an underlying mental health condition that does need active treatment. Um, or they're, they're, they're the great at sort of resourcing the, the professionals who can help um, and, and give more, um, you know, better time to that. But certainly not everybody who has a, a mental health condition or a mental health disorder um, or symptomatic of a mental health condition needs to see a psychiatrist. And this is again where I come in and working with the general practitioners. So general practitioners can link uh, my service, and we have another CPN, we have two community psychiatric nurses on Grand Cayman, and we have one um, on Cayman Brack as well, who covers the sister islands. So, you know, again, we don't work in uniform, we see people in their homes, we see people in clinics, we see people in coffee shops, anywhere that is conducive to a good conversation. Um, and of course, the, there's a, an array of private therapy out there. Um, there's also, we, we must be mindful as well of um, 
people who of our churches and pastoral counseling services and I would make mention of the Bethesda counseling service which is affiliated with the church I don't have the number here but it is in the phone book and another number that I didn't put down and it's very 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 important is the number for the crisis um, center and that number that's a service that is there 24 7 so if you've got concerns about someone who maybe experiences um, abuse at home um, and they're not sure what to do about it, you're not sure how to help them, you're not sure how to approach them, please, please feel free to, to reach out and to speak to them. If you feel someone is so unwell that they may be a danger to themselves or others, you can make an application under the Mental Health Act 2013. It's a section five and it's called a request for review. That is submitted to the government psychiatrist who based on the information that they're given can then make a decision whether or not that person needs to be um, taken to the hospital for a, an assessment. So those are a list of some of the services that is the mental health helpline, but we can put that up at the end. And then before I wrap it up I, and, and hand it over to questions and answers and, and to Shannon, I wanted to share a story of this photograph. So this is the story of a man in his 80th year. Um, from Northern Ireland, who is a retired veterinary inspector and a generational farmer. And up until July of this year, was living by himself with two sons who lived on the farmland with their families and other close um, children close by. So he had six children, in fact, and all five happened to be living in very close proximity. One happened to be living very far away. So anyway, this gentleman was relatively well and he did, however, suffer from an underlying medical condition. So he showed symptoms of difficulty breathing um, and wheezing and in fact, severe difficulty breathing. So he was taken to the hospital by um, two of his children and he was diagnosed with aspirational pneumonia um, and he was so well that they wanted to admit him. But unfortunately, it was a big hospital and there wasn't a bed available. So for two days, he lay in a corridor in an ER department until finally, um, fortunately, he showed some res good response to treatment. They said, look, we're going to have to send you home because we have no beds. So he was sent home and initially, of course, he was very relieved to be home. This man never been in the hospital. Well, actually, pr prior to that, maybe a brief stay, but generally not in the hospital. Very independent, very stubborn, very proud. Um, so he came home and he did make a very good recovery. Unfortunately, then other medical challenges set in um, and he became very weak and he had to be taken to the hospital again. And again, he was treated and, and sent home with a, another medical condition because there was no beds. Um, and then was very, very weak. And so for a couple of days was not making any progress and became so ill that the family returned him to the hospital again with the thought that in fact he was dying because he seemed so ill. And I think he himself thought that he was dying. So anyway, he ended up then being admitted to hospital because he was so ill, um, but he also tested positive, positive for COVID. And I thank God he had been vaccinated. Anyway, after 10 days in hospital, he was sent home with a care package of four carers coming in to his home during the day and a, a son or a daughter staying at night. At this point, the daughter who was overseas was aware of all of this and what was going on. But in discussion with the family and looking at the programme, looking at the whole, the overseeing the whole situation, recognised that they had to come home. Well, that person was me. So I made a mercy dash back to Northern Ireland to see my ailing father in August. And of course, this was challenged because it was very hard to get a flight. It was very difficult to get. Um, 
a flight off the island and then not to, to travel to London, but then to, to get to Northern Ireland as well. Anyway, fortunately, I got home. But if I'm absolutely honest, I packed for every eventuality. I also, you know, thought I might at some point be going home to a funeral, then my father would pass. Anyway, I'm very pleased to say that he didn't. And, you know, slowly but surely, and as the days moved ahead, he became stronger and stronger. And we were able to reduce the care package. Um, and of course, I mean, he found this very challenging, having strangers in his home, he was not used to it. In any case, um, we could see he was making progress. So on the day that this photograph was taken, it was an absolutely gorgeous day in September in Northern Ireland on the family farm, Baranault. And my brothers came into the kitchen of the farmhouse and said that they were moving sheep. And I said, well, do you need a hand? Because, you know, I have plenty of time in my hand and I'm sure daddy wouldn't mind. So they said, yeah, that would be great. You can come outside and you can stand here or whatever. Well, we heard this little voice from the background and it was my father. And he said, but I can help. And we looked at him, we looked at each other and then we thought, well, why not? Anyway, so before we knew it, the man was out on top of the quad and you see him there. He's kind of very small, very frail. He's like a little leprechaun. But he came out and he helped move the sheep. And what was really the most beautiful experience about that was that it we gave him the confidence to do something that he wanted to do. My father talked about losing his purpose, about not feeling important and not feeling needed, but he knew he could still do something. So because we had faith in him and because we had faith in ourselves and because we found a way of incorporating him into that situation, he was able to do it. And I'm very pleased to say that I left my father on the 7th of October and the day after, we were down to one carer in the morning, who he then duly sacked, and he's back to living by himself again. None of, none of his children have to stay with him at night. He's back to driving his car, and he's back to driving the quad. So have faith in your people, have faith in yourselves, and just think outside of the box. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. That was a touching story at the very end and a wonderful story. What I was going to do now is I'm going to turn it over to Shannon if she had any comments to make. And, and after Shannon's um, comments, so we could take some questions. Shannon? Great. Thanks, Will. Thank you, Dimna. That was a great presentation. Um, and thanks for the questions that went on in the chat. I was trying to be um, attentive to that and to the presentation at the same time. So uh, I think it raises a lot of really important issues. And I think one of the things I'm in an, a bit of an, I guess, advantageous, but also maybe a, a tricky situation that I'm both an employer who is trying to manage people at work and, and people's needs and the needs of the business. And I'm also a mental health professional. So who's not, advocating for all of the things that Dimna is advocating for and talking about. And so I guess I recognize the challenge in that, even as somebody who's, um, you know, whose career involves making sure that people are taking care of their mental health and seeing things from a psychological perspective, it is a real challenge for businesses to figure out how to navigate all of this. And I think some of the points about trusting yourself and trusting your people and also just um, recognizing that these are very, very uncertain times have been really helpful. It's something I've heard from a lot of the companies that we work with as an employee wellness program provider is the unknown. And I think uncertainty increases our sense of fear and worry. And so finding as much information as you can give to your employees is really helpful. I know that often information changes on a daily basis, especially right now with this sort of um, community spread that we're experiencing. But one of the things that I've found is helpful when I both speak to people who come to see me for psychological services, but also within our own organization is just the transparency of information. And I've found that most people are okay if their manager says, I'm not sure, as opposed to avoiding having those conversations. And so I think Dimna's point about 
communicating early and often is probably one of the biggest um, key things that, that we're hearing. One of the points of frustration often in a client might be that that it's the lack of information or it's not being feeling like they're part of decision-making. And I granted in, in organizations, not everybody's going to be part of the decision-making, but I think one that really clear communication on a regular basis, even if the communication is to say, we, we're not sure what tomorrow is going to bring, but you know, sure or not sure, we're going to be able, we're going to communicate that with you so that people are sort of at least up to date on what's happening within the organization. I think to be, um, oftentimes the government information that's coming is coming very quickly. It, it, it can be challenging sometimes to access or people, there's different ways to access it. And so having one place within your organization where all of the relevant information is posted and available to your employees is really helpful because then it saves them time having to sort of source it in their individual life. So whether it's a new regulation, whether it's a new updated um, policy with travel time, whether it's a new um, vaccine schedule, to, somebody in your organization can sort of be responsible for making sure that that information is posted so that your employees see that. We've found that that's been really helpful to just be able to take even the information from the government or from public health and then re-disseminate it um, in a way that maybe is more conducive to your employees to have that information available to them. The other thing that I think we focused on and I hear from a lot of people is that there's such a division right now in the community. People are divided on many, many issues. They're divided on issues of opening or closing. They're divided on issues of um, vaccination. They're divided on issues of how companies should be handling things. And so I love Dimna's slide at the very beginning, which is so true. There's you know, people are going to be on either sides of the fence. And as business leaders, the job is to figure out how to make this work and be mindful of everybody's needs. And I know that I hear from lots of employers that that is a real challenge. And I hear from lots of employees that if it's not being done right, they often feel um, like their needs are minimized or their concerns are not being heard or that there is um, this inability to sort of speak freely about what might be going on for them. And so it's a tricky dance to, um, to execute, but that ability to, I think, make sure that everybody, whether it's one-to-one -one meeting, whether it's small group meetings, maybe it's a peer mentor relationship, but where everybody's having a chance to sort of speak about their own unique situation, their own perspectives and beliefs, um, and to be able to sit with that without judgment. And listening without judgment is hard for human beings in general. It's particularly hard right now because as employers, you're not only the employer, but you're also the person going through the pandemic. And so all of the things that Dimna so articulately laid out for us are not only happening to your employees, they're happening to you and your family as well. And so this creates a really unique situation where I've tried to practice, you know, making sure that I'm checking in with myself before you're having discussions with staff or encouraging managers to do the same to recognize that everybody right now has some needs, but to also be patient. Um, I do think that like Dimna's father, people are resilient. And um, I think we're getting through this as a community. There's a lot of challenges and difficulties ahead. Um, and I think allowing yourself as business leaders to be human too, and to say, I'm not sure, or, you know, I'm really tired. I think there is something really important about being human right now and um, not to be perceived as a machine who is like void of any impact of this pandemic. And I think not only for your own mental health is that a bad thing to be doing, but also I think as a business leader to, to present this idea that um, that is the standard we are, we are shooting for having absolutely no challenges. And I think if you're setting that as the bar, then it's going to be really hard for people to come to you when they are struggling. But to have this ability to be able to say, yeah, this is the piece of this that's really hard for me. You know, I haven't seen my family um, in over two years. And so that's really hard. And so I think even sometimes sharing as leaders, the things that are challenging about this for yourself creates a bit of humanness. It allows sort of patience and compassion to flow both ways within the organization. 
And it often will allow other people then to talk about how they're feeling more readily. I don't know if there's some questions that come after that. Well, thank you again. I think I'll start it off. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, um, children can sense anxiety and fear in their parents very, very, very quickly. And from an employer's standpoint, there seems to be lots of anxiety, lots of fear out there about the reopening and about the safety. And that transcends into the attitude towards parents to, to, to children and so I guess uh, both you and Dimfna, maybe you can give us some advice as to how you both deal with, you know, the balance of the workplace anxiety as she, she provided some information, mm -hmm. but also about how do you address it with the children who you are there to protect them and make them feel as though they're loved and cared for. And during this time, I just get a sense there are a lot of children almost are as fearful as some of what we're seeing in the workplace? I think that's a really good point and a really good question. And I work a lot in the field of childhood anxiety. And I think pre you know, one of the main sort of fundamental things is, is helping people that have an anxiety disorder to be able to differentiate between what is a fear and what is the risk, mm -hmm. right? And so if somebody is afraid of getting in an elevator, there might be very little that I can do to convince them to not be afraid. And we can get into this argument about, don't be afraid, there's nothing to be afraid of, or we can look at what is the risk. And there is some inherent risk in taking, you know, in riding an elevator, but if we look at the risk from a very factual, calm way, and we remove kind of the emotion from it, then we start to be able to temper what is what is fear versus what is the real risk? And I think what makes it particularly tricky right now is that our kids are getting sick. And so um, the kids are testing positive, which then creates not only the, an increase in fear, but also an increase in risk. And so I think that one of the things that I've been spending an awful lot of time talking to parents about is exactly what you said, Will, managing your own anxiety. Anxiety is contagious within a family unit. Um, it's genetic if we're talking about disorders of anxiety um, emotions. And so we often have anxious parents and we have anxious kids and we probably have anxious grandparents somewhere down the line. And so for a parent to be able to recognize their own anxieties and prioritize managing that is probably the most helpful thing they can do for their children, but also to be focusing on what we have in our control and how we can keep ourselves safe and focusing on those kinds of things. And the information that we say to kids, you know, I'm not a big fan of the, of the daily dashboard um, or the daily announcement of the number of positive cases, because I think sometimes information in a silo is, is anxiety provoking. And for kids, it's good to say, you know what? Yeah, like one person in your class tested positive and thank goodness the other 24 are all negative and safe today. And so making sure you're balancing that information for the kids. Um, kids are definitely clued into what parents are doing and thinking and saying right now. And anxiety is high for all of us. Our brains and our stress response system has been activated for 20 months. And so from a pure neurochemical perspective, we are all a bit hot wired right now. And so anxiety is normal. Worry is normal. COVID is next door, maybe it's even in our own houses. So there's fear is real right now. So what we don't wanna be doing is minimizing it or saying there's nothing to worry about or it's silly to be worried, but to say, yeah, like it's really normal to be worried right now. And this is what we're gonna to do to keep ourselves safe. And for, for parents, especially, this is what your school is doing and this is what our government is doing. And for kids in particular, I think, when we're adults, we can get together and be as critical as we want to be about systems or organizations, but we have to be really mindful of how we're talking about that in front of kids. Because if we're saying things like this school doesn't know what they're doing, and then we're saying, okay, go off to school, that's adding to a child that's already anxious. And so we might really feel frustrated with the school or the workplace or whoever, whatever organization. But I think buffering children from that added stress 
is a really important thing to do in general, but especially right now where just emotions are high and conversations are intense. Dipna, do you want to add anything? Uh, I'm not <laughs> I think that's a fantastic response, Shannon. Um, I, I think it's important to normalize things as much as possible. So, you know, keep in daily routines to a pattern. You know, and one of the things I think is fundamentally really important as a family, uh, and maybe it's been lost over time, is that, you know, even sitting down to have that evening meal together or whatever it is that you eat together in, in the evening when children come in from school, whatever, having that time around the table, having children, you know, assist you in preparing things, you know, it's it's giving them an opportunity to ex express themselves, but it's not putting, it's not saying, okay, we want to sit down and talk about these things. It's doing it in a very relaxed and open way. And everybody has a, a seat at the table. Everybody can share their concerns. Uh, but as I say, it really is about normalizing things and then making your children feel involved and, and prepared. I was going to say, <laughs> does anybody have any questions? You can unmute your mic and, and then we'll happy to answer those if anybody has a question uh, following the presentations. Well, if nobody is, is coming forward, I'll have another question for the workplace. Um, obviously, most employers, uh, the larger companies in particular, put in a lot of health and safety protocols in place, and they have procedures and guidelines and everything that the you know, larger businesses put in place. But the smaller businesses are probably taking this on the fly. Um, they're, they only have, you know, particularly the majority of chamber members uh, are small businesses. And, you know, when somebody tests positive in their organization, it really impacts their business quite dramatically. So how do you kind of help those business owners out and to reduce their level of anxiety? Because basically when two of their employees test positive, some of their businesses can come to a standstill. Yeah, I don't, I think it's really hard to, to yeah. tell those people oh, it's going to be okay, right? Because there's a lot of moving parts and, and there's a, a massive sort of responsibility on the business owner to meet the needs of the employer. Um, and I think that having opportunities like this, maybe where the business owner gets to have some support or some um, discussions. I know within the healthcare, with particularly within the behavioral health community, the private sector in particular, we've done a great deal of sharing. So if somebody's written a policy, mm. we're sharing it with everybody. Um, if somebody's written a, a policy about this, then we're sharing it with everybody so that we're helping each other. Like we're, if I can save somebody a day of policy writing when really they're a clinician, then I'm happy to do that and vice versa. People have done that for me. So I don't know within organizations, um, that could be something like reach out to somebody who has a similar business to you and say like, do you have yeah. a policy, like a template that I could use? Maybe that's something even the chamber could provide like some, some templates of what a policy looks like um, because they can be difficult. Like you're right. And, and I think most small businesses are run by people who are, whatever that small business does. So if it's a plumbing business, it's run by a plumber. I've got a psychology business run by a psychologist. Mm -hmm. If you, you know, you've got a, a hair salon, you, it's run by a hair stylist. Right. And so those aren't people with business backgrounds, policy development backgrounds. And so I think that is a real challenge for the small business provider that isn't um, necessarily felt by the large corporations that have entire teams that provide all of this guidance that comes sort of trickling down. So I, I'm glad you've raised that point. I think even to just hear that validated, I yeah. think uh, it can be really helpful that it's, it is hard right now. And we're hearing a lot, well, you know, the, well, your boss should do this or your boss needs to do that. And I think for the most part, employers are doing the best that they can and I think that those, you know, sharing of templates or relying on somebody else to help you with a problem is really important. And I think as a small business owner to be really, it's okay to ask for help right now. None of us know 
what we're doing, right? Everybody, I think, is trying to figure this out in the best way possible, in the most like ethical and fair and safe, safe for employees and clients and customers and business. And I just think that asking, you know, reaching out to somebody that you know that might be in a similar business and saying, hey, can we just chat for a bit about how you're handling this? And sometimes there's a sense of pride. We don't really want to admit we don't know. Um, maybe we're feeling a bit like that's somebody that I'm in competition with. So I don't want to show some vulnerability. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think right now is the time for real collectiveness and, and that authentic like willingness to be there for each other. That came in kind mantra that we continue to hear about is not just from the business owner down to the employee. It's really business owner to business owner in terms of, hey, how can I help? And, and, you know, if I've got some knowledge or I've had, you know, as soon as I had my first COVID positive client in the office and first COVID positive employee, I sent an email around going, hey, we're dealing with it. Let, if anybody wants to brainstorm every, like, this is how I'm handling it, if anybody can help. And it's really just kind of feeling confident to put yourself out there and ask for that help because you need that help. We all need that help and we all deserve it. And to yeah. answer your question about the templates, um, we have had some of our members share some of their templates. And that's one of the projects that we're working on now to provide some useful guidance to the small business owners. Um, because, you know, they suffered a lot during the pandemic. Uh -huh. I mean, this pandemic, you know, they've been, some of them have been without business for a year and a half. I know. And you, you, can, you can sympathize with that, particularly some of them that have large loans for, um, you know, such as um, you know, water sports equipment and, and other things. So, yeah. uh -huh. Dimpna, you wanted to say something? Yeah, just that, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, it's really important to plan, right? Um, and we talk about planning all the time. We talk about it in our personal lives and our professional lives. You know, hazard management is always telling us every hurricane <laughs> season, plan, plan, plan. But actually, it's so true because forewarned is forearmed, right? And with the the challenges that we've had in the last year and a half and many of these problems these small businesses have dealt with and i've known people who run small businesses and how they've um, adapted to them how they have made changes uh, and as you know shannon says to reach out and, and ask for help and you know that help may come in strange forms right so you might actually be asking family and friends to you know can you just cover a little bit of this just to help as in any situation you know it's uncharted water um, so not, not not to be frightened to ask for help, but to, to look and see what other people, what challenges they've had and how they've yeah. coped with it. There is a question in the chat. Um, what are you seeing large businesses do to protect their at-risk population in their workforces, the immunocompromised during this current phase on the, the pandemic in Cayman? Are they making accommodations to permit them to work from home where they have the ability to do so? Well, I would hope so. I mean, that, that certainly goes without saying, but I can't speak for the entire business community or, but I would hope so that people would be accommodated. And I think that, you know, the one thing that we have learned in the last year and a half and in the last couple of years, and certainly within the workplace environment is that we have to be more accommodating. We have to be more understanding of people's needs and address all of those needs. You know, this, this is a, it's a, it's a big world, but it's a very small world at the same time. And, and we have to we have to be compassionate that everybody has a role. And if it's a, a change of role that perhaps has to be uh, adapted to accommodate someone. But I mean, I think that, yeah, we have to accommodate people. We have to hear their concerns and, and they have to be able to take those to you as well. So I would hope that they they are accommodated. I've heard some really good examples of employers being very flexible, uh -huh. um, particularly those companies that are office driven. Um, we're going to have we're going to have another presentation, another webinar about office practices um, specific and those industries that can have more employees work from home. Uh -huh. So I know there are some of the larger firms actually their employees are indeed working from home almost uh -huh. indefinitely now. Uh -huh. So it has changed the complexion of the workplace which also brings along another issue from a psychiatric element, which is disconnection of human exactly. beings. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and it's, it's fine that we're talking remotely like this, but I someday along the line, you'd like to have some human interaction exactly. with people. Well, yeah. and I think that's, you know, it's, it's a really good point, Will, because as mental health providers, obviously we were all on telehealth when the lockdown was mandated. And we've been, you know, in our own efforts to sort of reduce the number of people in the clinic and take all of our own health and safety practices, been encouraging telehealth. And we're finding that people want connection, right? They want that human connection um, because there has been so much remote life, remote family meetings, remote birthday parties, remote working for lots of people in our community. And so uh, you know, when they're sort of, when we're saying offering a, a telehealth service, it's like, no, I, this is the, I want this human connection. I really see that having some long-term psychological impact. Yeah. So we have to really find ways to safely connect to people, especially while COVID seems to be surging in our community, because we know that the part of the brain that is highly activated under periods of extreme and prolonged stress is neutralized uh -huh. through human social contact, uh -huh. right? And so it's why we can soothe a very distressed baby by rocking and rubbing their back. It's why a big hug when you're really sad seems to just help you settle down a little bit. There's no, uh, it, it, this isn't all by coincidence. This is the way that the brain is developed and, and has evolved because it's adaptive that we need that human connection. And so I agree with you, like the safe practices of remote working uh -huh. are, are amazing, particularly for those people who are higher risks, but then it does have the challenges on the other end in that some people struggle a great deal from a mental health perspective without enough contact. And, it, and it's, yeah. it's balancing, it's how do, we, how do we make that work? And I think it goes right back to, to your, to your point in one of your slides about just having those conversations with people on your team and finding out because each person's situation might be different and somebody might have plenty of people at home to contact with but a lot of our, a lot of our workers are also here on island without family and extended yeah. support networks and yeah. so the office becomes their family and then if they're not seeing those people it can be it can add to it and likewise um, sometimes a lot of people I've had employees who'd rather come to the office because home is stressful. Mm -hmm. And so the office at least is a place where they can get a cup of coffee and have their space and it's very, you know, predictable. And, and so I think, again, it's like having the ability to communicate with everybody to find out what is working best for mm -hmm. you. Yeah. And maybe it's like a hybrid approach almost, but I know that some people need, as you said, they need the stimulation of going out to work every day. And I'm one of those people that, you know, fortunately for me, my job isn't something that I can really work at home from five days a week, you know, because I'm very patient centric, right? So I can't bring all of my patients into my home and I, not all of my patients are available through Zoom or, you know, any telemed or whatever, right? Yeah. I have to go and find them. But I need the stimulation of, of getting up every day and forcing myself to go to work. You know, and I've always said that, you know, if I win the lottery, which you know, I'm always hopeful <laughs> of, that I will still work part time because I need that for myself. Right. And I think the other fear is that for people who do suffer from perhaps a low grade social anxiety or, you know, generally just being someone who's a bit awkward around people, who's a bit shy the danger of them being on their own is that those feelings can become heightened and those conditions can become heightened. And if someone is, you know, perhaps vulnerable to low moods, right? That again, you know, when we're not stimulated, we don't, it's, it's a bonus, right? So the, my concern moving forward would that would we have to find some way of accommodating everybody, but it's not an answer. It's not a one, you know, shoe fits all, definitely mm -hmm. not. Yeah. Well, ladies, I'd, I'd like to thank you and our audience uh, for tuning into this, this presentation. I'm glad that we kicked off this series with more of a human element, because I think the COVID situation, really, it's all about human connectivity uh -huh. and the challenges that we've all experienced from not seeing some of our family members, from experiencing loss in our families, 
to the difficult challenges that we face in the workplace from small businesses suffering loss and even larger businesses not being able to cope. So it's good that we kicked off the series with this focus, I believe. And again, I'd like to thank both of you for uh, your great presentations and your interventions and everyone who has uh, participated in this. Many of you were quiet. You didn't put anything into the chat, but that's okay. That means you're, you're, um, you're listening to the presentations and hopefully absorbing the information. So on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce and the Cayman Islands government and everyone involved in these presentations, we'd like to thank you for tuning in and hopefully you'll, you'll tune, kind of dial back in for some of the other webinars that we have coming up. So good, good morning. Thank you, Will. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Take everybody. Care. Bye. Bye.